ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to welcome you to this event on reducing global security risks, the agenda for 2021 and beyond. While I wish that we were able to welcome you all into Baker Hall in person, as we have in past years, I'm glad that we can conduct this important event remotely. This conversation could not be more timely and in my humble opinion, could not feature better interlocutors. We are in a period of global uncertainty in which the COVID-19 pandemic has altered not only our daily ways of life, but has also brought about geopolitical uncertainty at many levels. This worldwide health crisis coupled with ongoing international tensions, such as between the United States and Iran, underscores the need to reckon with the, what the future holds in terms of biological and nuclear threats. Senator Sam Nunn and Secretary Ernest Moniz of the Nuclear Threat Initiative are unparalleled voices to speak on these issues. The Senator and Secretary addressed the Carnegie Corporation board meeting uh, which I attended in early 2019, during which I was truly captivated by how both men used their illustrious careers in public service and science to promote a safer world. I am confident that their remarks today will prove engaging and informative for a wide range of audiences. So <clears throat> with no further ado, I will now turn to Dr. Neil Lane, the Baker Institute Senior Fellow in Science and Technology and former director of the White House Office of Science and Technology, who will introduce each speaker and moderate today's conversation. Neil. Thank you, Ed. Uh, I can certainly concur in that we are very fortunate to have with us today two of the world's top experts uh, on the threats posed by nuclear proliferation and biological weaponry. And, and novel weaponry, I would say, into international security. Our speakers, of course, have long and distinguished careers at the top of their fields, and it's a privilege for me to introduce them. Senator Sam Nunn served as a U.S. Senator from Georgia from 1972 to 1997, during which time he chaired the Senate Armed Services Committee from 1987 to 1995. During this time, and his time in Congress, Senator Nunn authored the Nunn-Luger Cooperative Threat Reduction Act alongside Indiana Senator Richard Lugar. Senator Nunn founded the Nuclear Threat Initiative in 2001, the mission of which is to be a nonprofit global security organization focused on reducing nuclear and biological threats imperiling humanity. He served as NTI's chief executive officer for 16 years after which he was succeeded by our second speaker, Secretary Ernest Moniz, a nuclear physicist who is currently CEO of NTI, before which he served as US Secretary of Energy from 2013 to 2017. I've known Ernie Moniz going back to my time in the Clinton administration, during which he served as Associate Director for Science in the Office of Science and Technology Policy and then as Undersecretary of Energy. Ernie, it's great to have you today. In today's discussion, Senator Nunn and Secretary Moniz will share their views on how domestic and international policymakers should understand and reduce the risks associated with nuclear and biologically, biological weaponry. It's especially important, not only amidst the geopolitical upheaval across the world, but also due to the vulnerabilities posed by new technological innovations. After Senator Nunn and Secretary Moniz delivered their remarks, I'll moderate a question and answer session, and we encourage all of you to submit questions via the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screens. Without further ado, Senator Nunn, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Neil. Can you hear me? Yes, sir, coming in clear. Okay, good. Uh, Ambassador, thank you very much. And Neil, thank you very much. And uh, I would just start by saying I followed uh, Baker Institute since its founding, I believe in the mid 90s. Jim Baker is one of the finest uh, public servants I've ever known. He's a guy that always went right to the heart of what is the problem and who are the players 
what can we do to find a solution and how do we bring the folks around the table to, to make it happen? So Jim was uh, truly, um, as, the, uh, as the new book says, uh, the guy who ran, who ran the nation's capital and actually in many instances ran our own government. Uh, so tell Jim, Joy, hello for me. I understand he's protecting an invasion of birds to pre prevent them from heading um, down in the southern part of Texas to the northern part of the country. So thank him for continuing to protect our country this time from quail. Um, and let me just try to outline as, as I think uh, Jim Baker would, um, would normally do, what is the problem and sort of what, what is it we can do about it? First of all, I, I think I would say that we're in a new era in terms of the nuclear threat. Uh, not in the last one or two years, but in the last 10 years. Uh, we've got nine nuclear weapon states now, that is states that are armed with. We're hearing you now, Senator. Yeah, we, okay. lost, we lost you a little while ago. If you could just repeat what you were, you were saying about a minute ago. Okay, well, I was saying we were in a new, we were in a new era of, of nuclear threat. The spread of nuclear know-how, um, not to be able to uh, necessarily build a sophisticated weapon, to build one that would blow up and change the whole equation in the world in terms of confidence in a city or a downtown area. I call that catastrophic terrorism. Uh, so the uh, availability of nuclear materials is also uh, too widespread. We've made progress on that front. We can talk about that's one encouraging spot, but the spread of um, radiological weapon uh, material as well as uh, uh, weapon material that could be used to make a bomb uh, is one of our biggest problems. Uh, we also have a breakdown of arms control. If you look at the whole realm of treaties we've had to kind of reduce risk and government behavior over the last 20, 25 years, the ABM Treaty, uh, Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty is gone. The Conventional Forces in Europe Treaty uh, is now both the uh, US and Russia have withdrawn from that treaty. The INF Treaty, Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty, regulating medium range missiles in Europe, one of the Reagan administration's big accomplishments. That one has now been terminated just in the last year. The Open Skies Agreement, which was a, a dream of President Eisenhower and I believe was entered into under H.W. Bush is now uh, been terminated by the United States. The Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty uh, is being adhered to, that's the good news, but uh, it has never been ratified, so it's in fragile territory. And the Nuclear Proliferation uh, Treaty uh, is uh, under a great deal of stress. So we've got uh, real challenges in the uh, structure of trying to regulate and reduce risk uh, by agreement with the major nuclear powers, particularly the United States and Russia. Uh, the New START Treaty is still in effect, and that's something we can be grateful for. It will expire on February the 4th of 2021. President-elect Biden has said he will renew that. That's enormously important because verification provisions in that treaty are key to the foundation for uh, building further reductions um, in terms of an agreement. So I'm hoping that that treaty will be extended by President-elect Biden as one of his first acts. Uh, and then finally, I would just add, I think the new era includes in particular the fact that I believe we are more likely, this is a subjective judgment, uh, but I believe we're more likely to have a war by mistake or blunder than we are by premeditated attack. And the cyber world has greatly increased that because if uh, nuclear powers or third parties hack into warning systems or command and control systems is much more likely to be a blunder or an accident. And this is an area where uh, every country that has nuclear weapons has a, a fundamental uh, mutual interest and we ought to be able to work on that problem. Now, let me just give you my brief to-do list. Each one of them could take a lot of uh, discussion, but if I started, I would say uh, the number one thing is to extend the New START legislation. And I think President-elect uh, Biden will do that. The second point on my list would be renew a sustained 
strategic nuclear dialogue with Russia. I think Jim Baker would agree, and I've heard him say something similar to this many times that you, know, you basically diplomacy going going into diplomacy with an adversary does not mean you're rewarding rewarding them for good behavior. It means you have mutual interest that you have to really deal with each other on to protect your own citizens. And that's what we really need to do with the Russians. Too often we've treated dialogue with the Russians in recent years as a reward or punishment to, if we don't go into negotiations with them. That's a mistake for both countries. Uh, a third item on my list would be to protect nuclear materials wherever they are in the world. The long pole in the tent for any terrorist group that would try to make a crude weapon would be uh, trying to find the nuclear materials, uh, weapons usable nuclear materials. So we must protect that uh, like we would the gold in Fort Knox. Uh, and that has to be done globally. I would add to that much more difficult, but we need to protect radiological material uh, because it, it can be used not to make a, a bomb that's going to detonate, but to make um, a dirty bomb that could really wreck a financial district and we are fortunate we have not had dirty bombs so far, and hopefully we can continue to predict that, prevent that. Uh, winding up my list, I, I would hope right up front that the uh, new Biden administration, when they take office, would call in their military leaders, the Secretary of Defense, and ask for a fail-safe review. That means reviewing all of our nuclear systems, uh, reviewing, reviewing, and uh, giving close examination to command and control and warning systems, looking at the cyber threat, determining how we can safeguard our own systems. That would be an internal review, not a treaty negotiation, not an agreement. Very, it'd be very difficult to verify uh, in this area. But uh, I think we should also um, challenge other nuclear weapon states, the other eight nuclear weapon states to have their own internal review out of that, I think a number of these weapon states will discover that we've got to find a way to draw red lines on cyber. Uh, finally, I would say that uh, Congress needs to organize itself so they create a political space for the executive branch to actually deal with these issues. Uh, I would say particularly the issues of dealing with Russia. I would say the issues of dealing with China. And I would say the issues of repairing damage in NATO as well as the nuclear issues. Uh, that kind of liaison group working from the leadership in Congress with the executive branch, Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense, could go a long way to uh, both informing Congress and having them play a meaningful role as all also with encouraging the executive branch and creating an atmosphere for dialogue, which is enormously important. The final item on my list uh, is that um, we got to, we've got to increase decision time. If our leaders now have four or five minutes to make a decision about whether to launch nuclear weapons, if they, uh, if they are informed that there may be a nuclear attack underway, um, and if, if it's four or five minutes now, I think we need to call in our military commanders and ask them to find ways to give us more decision time. This necessitates at some point working with the Russians they have a mutual stake as we do. We have a mutual stake in each other's warning systems. Uh, we too often don't think about that. If something goes wrong with the Russian warning system uh, and they think they're under attack, we're the ones who get hit. So let me just wind it up right there, uh, Neil, and uh, turn it over to Ernie for, uh, I'm sure, a discussion about a lot of these new technologies and we can come back to some of the biological items uh, if you choose. So. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be with you. Thank you, Senator. Ernie Moniz. Okay, well, thanks, Neil. And uh, uh, Sam has, has really laid out uh, uh, a lot of the, uh, of the space, uh, in particular for uh, dealing with the, uh, unfortunately, strategic instability uh, that has grown uh, in our relationship uh, with, uh, with Russia. And in fact, I should add, uh, for context, uh, for, for, the, uh, for the participants, that... Uh, the United States and Russia still possess uh, more than 90% of the roughly 14,000 uh, nuclear weapons uh, in the world. And that's why this, this focus on Russia uh, remains, remains so important. We'll come later to some, some, other, some other regions. 
But as Sam said, uh, one of the areas I'll, I'll focus on is this issue of technology evolution and, and what it means uh, for this entire discussion. Uh, regrettably, uh, a lot of our policy uh, remains rooted in 60 years ago when the situation uh, technologically and also on the ground in terms of uh, the US and, and the Soviet Union uh, being a totally different uh, kind, kind of situation. So for example, uh, 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 Senator Nunn mentioned uh, the importance of the uh, extension of the New START uh, uh, Treaty. Uh, the New START Treaty uh, is the last uh, pillar really of the entire arms control regime. Uh, it's the last, um, last man standing uh, in terms of having uh, some of the mutual verification issues uh, that are so important between the United States uh, and Russia. Uh, and it, of course, it, it caps the uh, number of deployed, deployed systems. But let's say we do, and again, I agree with Sam that we will, that the Biden administration will uh, accept uh, Putin's invitation uh, to uh, straightforwardly extend for five years the New START Treaty. But it's also the last five years of the New START Treaty. So very, very critical is going to be setting out early on uh, the scope uh, uh, of the new negotiations that must take place for a successor to New START. And those negotiations now are going to have to uh, recognize the reality of, uh, of new technologies, for example. Uh, will the, uh, how will uh, hypersonic glide vehicles come in? Uh, underwater uh, nuclear drones uh, uh, with, with, uh, with, with AI, uh, tactical weapons, uh, that is those, those uh, uh, for short, relatively short range delivery uh, remains a big issue. The issues of missile defense uh, have never been really brought into the arms control discussions and yet is a major concern of Russia and also of China. Uh, the, what about the fact that so many delivery systems now are ambiguous with regard to nuclear versus uh, conventional uh, uh, warheads? Uh, cybersecurity was already mentioned uh, by Sam in the, in the context of potential vulnerabilities of command and control systems. But what about the entire digitization uh, going on right now of the uh, American uh, uh, stockpile uh, and delivery systems in the context of the very expensive 1.5, 1.7 trillion dollar modernization of the uh, of that uh, nuclear system. Uh, the modernization includes digitization. Uh, well, if we're worried about cyber and the command and control systems, we have to be worried about cyber and digitization uh, throughout the the entire system. What about taking advantage of technologies uh, to lower risks? For example, uh, uh, Senator Nunn mentioned uh, the critical issue of decision time. Well, perhaps we should be talking about getting the roughly the nearly thousand delivery systems that we and the Russians each have on so-called prompt launch. Perhaps we should be looking at the taboo area of self-destruct mechanisms, a technological way of, of essentially providing more, more, uh, more time by not having a use it or lose it decision uh, become uh, irrevocable. Uh, another interesting area where uh, we at NTI have pioneered over the last year is uh, taking advantage of the fact that there is so much information publicly available today uh, and available for analysis through our artificial intelligence machine learning tools. So for example, we've had a pilot project in the last year that took all kinds of trade data uh, and looked at patterns of uh, potential uh, proliferation behavior and indeed found tens of, of entities that uh, could be engaging in proliferant behavior According, according to their trade patterns. How, does, how is that going to expand into the future when, uh, when all kinds of 
databases are available, including those from space, uh, to be integrated to detect proliferant behavior in new ways. So it's a very, very complex uh, uh, scene uh, with, uh, with new technologies uh, presenting both challenges uh, and also opportunities uh, for, uh, for risk uh, reduction. And I, by the way, I could have added to that the entire issue of, of space technologies. Uh, space is a largely unregulated arena uh, in terms of these kinds of security issues, uh, something that at some point uh, is, going to have to, is going to have to change. To, to change uh, uh, gears, let me note two last things uh, before opening it up. One is, of course, uh, while Russia and the United States, uh, uh, that relationship is, is critical be because of the sheer number of nuclear weapons, the reality is we're going to have to start paying more attention, for example, to the nuclear situation with, with China. Uh, now, we've had suggestions in the last couple of years that somehow China uh, should join uh, any extension of New START, uh, an excuse, frankly, in my view, given by the current administration for not extending it. Well, okay, that's a bad idea. I mean, uh, but, it, but it's a good idea that we need to start opening up the channels of communication with China, not on numbers, because they have so many fewer uh, weapons and, and delivery systems, at least at the moment, but there are other, other movements. For example, uh, Presidents Reagan and Gorbachev issued a very important statement in the 1980s that nuclear war cannot be won and therefore should not be fought. It would be great to have that repeated by the US and Russia, but why wouldn't China join in on that? Maybe the P5, maybe including the UK and, and France as well. Uh, what about the longstanding uh, practice of the US and Russia notifying uh, about, uh, about, about missile tests. Well, China could go, in, go into that. The point is without giving the whole list that there are many areas of starting this dialogue with, with China uh, that I think would be, would be very, very important. That of course immediately spills over to the uh, necessary engagement of China if we are going to address the North Korean problem successfully. Here again, uh, uh, the senator and I give credit to the Bush administration, uh, to the uh, Trump administration, excuse me, uh, for opening up the channel to North Korea. But unfortunately, it was not done in a way to be productive. Uh, what we need is to open up that channel, uh, engage strongly uh, the regional uh, security players, including, of course, South Korea and Japan, as well as China. Uh, and we need to get a professional type of, of dialogue going step by step for what is inevitably a long process. At NTI, and again, uh, Sam and, and, uh, and uh, Dick Lugar, uh, their pioneering ideas on cooperative threat reduction, those could be applied and offered to North Korea. Many, many ways we can go. We have to get creative about this uh, in terms of risk reduction. And of course, the other uh, arena uh, is, the, is the Gulf, uh, Iran uh, and, the, and the Gulf states and the evolution there, the concern about, uh, about um, not having uh, nuclear weapons uh, proliferation in that region. Uh, again, the Biden administration uh, has talked explicitly about uh, resuming diplomacy with Iran, uh, about getting back to the JCPOA and then extending it uh, into other areas of concern uh, in terms of Iran's regional and missile behavior. Uh, and uh, we are fully supportive of that. Uh, we have to say, however, that even, this, even the act of reopening negotiations and diplomacy uh, will be fraught with uh, many, many challenges, many issues, but that's what diplomacy is about. It's not about looking for uh, the one magic uh, meeting uh, that resolves major issues, uh, long-standing issues, but of rolling up one's sleeves and doing that hard work of, uh, of knocking off issue by issue uh, in terms of these major, major challenges. Finally, I'll just say a word about uh, uh, the biological threats. NTI, from its, from its initiation, when Sam and Ted Turner founded it uh, at the beginning of 2001, uh, had, a, had an impact 
uh, in the uh, bio, uh, biosecurity world. But in 2017, because of technology evolution, specifically the enormous developments in synthetic biology and uh, gene editing uh, and the like, uh, at NTI, we decided to uh, ramp up uh, our biosecurity operations uh, uh, significantly. Uh, and uh, we did that. And of course, timing is everything. Uh, in, in, um, uh, in October of 2019, so just over a year ago, uh, we published the world's first uh, index to rate countries in pandemic preparedness. Uh, it was not a pretty picture. Uh, regrettably, very shortly thereafter, COVID uh, was a demonstration of the world's lack of preparedness to, uh, to manage uh, 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 pandemics. So we continue to work on that, uh, working with the biotech industry, for example, to get global uh, screening of, uh, of DNA uh, uh, orders, uh, uh, working uh, with the World Economic Council and others uh, to uh, form, we hope, a global normative uh, organization for, uh, uh, for diminishing the risks of uh, particularly engineered organisms, but in general, uh, pandemics uh, of, of, any, of any origin, uh, and working as uh, kind of a liaison between uh, the, uh, the public health, biotech, and national security agencies issues, uh, 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 entities that must, must come together. So I hope between Sam's comments and mine, you get a flavor at least of the range of the challenges and also some of the directions that we are taking to try to address these. Thank you, Neil. Thank you very much, Secretary Moniz and uh, Senator Nunn. Uh, frankly, it all sounds scary to me. Let, let me ask you, maybe start with Senator Nunn. How surprised should we be that we have not already had a major nuclear or bioterrorist incident. Are you surprised? I'm surprised we haven't had a dirty bomb because radiological material, uh, differentiating that from weapons usable material, the radiological material you would use a conventional explosion and just blow the radiation in uh, various directions. And so the question of damage would depend on uh, the size of the conventional explosion and how much dissemination there was but it would poison the whole area. And it would, uh, for instance, an economic zone, close it up for years uh, while it was uh, trying, while they were trying to clean it up. So yes, I, I think we've been very lucky not to have, have a radiological. On the actual nuclear detonation, uh, it's, it's not a piece of cake. I mean, the know-how is widely available, but a terrorist group would have to have some people that really knew what they were doing. To even if they had nuclear material. But if they get nuclear material, which as I mentioned, that's their long pole in the tent, um, they, they could figure out a way to make a crude nuclear weapon with a, a few experienced people. And that has been one of the real focuses of NTI. Now, there is good news there, Neil, um, because uh, there were uh, 20 years ago, approximately 20 years ago, there were 40 countries uh, that had weapons usable nuclear material. Only nine countries with a weapon, but 40 countries had highly enriched uranium, which would be the easiest material for a terrorist group to work with. And now, uh, thanks to a lot of work in the beginning in the, in the George W. Bush administration, uh, greatly intensifying in the Obama administration, we've gone from 40 countries down to 22 countries. There's been a lot of focus on that, a lot of work. So if there's one bit of good news, uh, that's it. Uh, but we have a long way to go. Uh, those last 22 countries, nine of whom are weapon states, are going to be very hard to give up their nuclear materials. But we've got to really focus on that and work on that. Now, when you say give it up, they don't have to give it up. They blend it down and put it in a state where it could be used for nuclear fuel, but not, uh, not detonated. Uh, so, yes, I, I, I think we've been very fortunate. Um, and I think we're going to have a similar challenge in the biological area. We're gonna to have to work very hard to um, prevent uh, biological incidents because any terrorist group looking at the recent uh, economic damage and loss of life with COVID internationally has got to say, hey, uh, can we do that? And I think um, modern science 
uh, is going to have to be used to work for us and uh, not simply the dark side. So, yes, um, we've been fortunate. Our militaries have been professional, both in the Soviet days as well as uh, uh, since Russia has uh, uh, split away. Um, but we've been very, very fortunate. And I do not think we should bet that the next 40 years we're going to be as fortunate as we have for the last 40. Uh, Neil, may, may I just add a, add a footnote for you and the ambassador uh, that uh, Houston uh, is uh, well known and other parts of Texas too, but uh, Houston is very well known for its medical complex, which means that you can bet you have a bunch of cesium-137 sources uh, that I would highly recommend you replace uh, by x-ray technology. <laughs> And, and we're, we're happy to help you with that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that comment. We will certainly pass that along. Uh, Ernie, uh, so you raised in, in the, uh, at the end of your comments, you, you raised the issue of uh, bioweaponry and, uh, and bio uh, incidents, uh, accidental or otherwise. My, my understanding is the reason, one reason perhaps we haven't seen the use of biological uh, entities, pathogens in, uh, in, in weapon, in, in military activity is because it's hard to target actually. I mean, you release some of the stuff, you don't quite know where it goes, but with modern medical technology, uh, my sense is we are starting to have the means to think about targeting biological weapons, uh, to regions maybe even eventually tailor them to individuals or, or particular communities. Uh, is, is that correct way to think about it? Or, or how, how would you say is the increasing threat, let's say, of biological weaponry or accidents? Uh, I think, yeah, you're, you're, you're certainly straight on, Neil. But let, let me first, I think, uh, just repeat what Sam already said, uh, and that maybe one reason we also have seen less activity than we might have, which was good, uh, is because the scale of the impact probably was not appreciated. Uh, and COVID has shown that the unthinkable does happen uh, when you look at the disruption uh, that was, uh, that's was that been caused. I, as a reminder, 9-11 uh, uh, caused uh, enormous uh, disruption and, and continues to this day to impose enormous costs on us uh, 3,000 people roughly uh, died uh, there. Today, we're, in the United States, we're having nearly 3,000 people die daily uh, from, uh, from COVID, and we still have 10 million people out of jobs, et cetera, et cetera. So I think the, uh, Sam unfortunately uh, pointed out, I mean, I mean, pointed out uh, that unfortunately, uh, um, the impact uh, may now be appreciated uh, uh, much, uh, much more. However, uh, what you've raised in terms of the very dark side uh, and the possibility of now uh, genetically targeted uh, bad organisms uh, is certainly um, very much in, in, the, in our thinking. Uh, the United States government is, is also very concerned uh, about, about that, targeting specific populations, for example, um, uh, with, with uh, various characteristics. Uh, could be extremely, um, extremely bad. And going back to technology, uh, we are now uh, getting to the, the, the place where these kinds of synthetic biology and gene editing techniques are going to be able to be, be done on, you know, on desktops. Uh, um, uh, they're going to be middle, middle school experiments. Uh, and uh, 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 just to make you feel uncomfortable even more, about a year and a half ago, uh, the, uh, no, I guess it was now uh, two and a half years ago, uh, a, a very respectable uh, academic group uh, from Canada published a paper uh, in which they demonstrated how uh, in six months, and for very little expense, uh, they could synthesize de novo a uh, horsepox virus, which is extremely close to smallpox. So that's the kind of thing that we are, uh, we are very, very concerned about. And as these uh, technologies and capabilities 
devolve even more uh, throughout, you know, throughout society and the world, uh, uh, it's going to be very difficult. And therefore, we are going to need very, very strong global uh, cooperation. Uh, and we are going to need the ability uh, to have tremendous surveillance networks and ability to uh, intercede very, very quickly before pandemics uh, grow. Uh, Senator, um, one, one issue that we're facing in this country and around the world when, when we need to put in place policies of all different kinds, but here today we're talking about national security, is the public's lack of understanding of these issues. And these are enormously complex issues and uh, lots of misinformation around. Uh, and uh, we've seen uh, in very recent times how quickly uh, false information can spread and influence huge numbers, large fractions of our population. Um, how far can the policymakers really go unless we somehow bring along the public, those folks who vote for senators and representatives and presidents? Start with Senator and... Well, I think um, what Ernie just said about the threat of deliberate use of biological materials and what you said about dissemination of technology advancing, I think must cause us to scratch our heads. And, and it, we're gonna to have to have a, an education starting with Congress um, in terms of creating a, a, what I call an existential box, where even if we have disagreements and disputes and fundamental differences and values with countries like Russia and China, where we understand that there's a certain box of things we have to deal with those countries own even if we don't trust them and we don't like them. In fact, particularly if we don't trust them and don't like them, uh, they have the same interests we do. I mean, as I can't imagine a uh, Russian government wanting a terrorist group to be able to manufacture and disseminate anything resembling smallpox, for instance. Uh, but they did, Soviet Union did a lot of research on weaponizing smallpox back in the old days, so they know a lot about it. Um, so I, I think the existential box has got to be developed. The other thing, Neil and Ed, and you guys saw it, I know, in your tremendous diplomatic careers, um, but the Congress uh, has to be an educational institute. Part of the congressional role is to learn from experts and to talk to their constituents about it. Uh, it's not that the members of Congress are smarter. Uh, than the constituents is the constituents are trying to do other things. They're trying to make a living, take care of the families. We hire people to go to Washington, uh, men and women with intelligence, not because they're experts, but because they should be able to learn and help educate the rest of us. And th that's a function of committee hearings in a large part. I, I think uh, committee hearings have to be brought back where you get a panel of experts where you don't have all the same views but you sit there and you ask them questions and you parse out where the differences are as an educational tool. We have tremendous information technology. There ought to be, you know, things are streamed live everywhere now. Uh, but right now, it seems to me we have, we're having less of that educational role of Congress than we've ever had. The other thing, I don't have an answer to this, but we've got to, uh, as Pat Moynihan said, everybody's not entitled to their, same, to the, to their own set of facts. And right now in Washington and really around the country, everybody is deciding they, they, uh, they want their own facts. And uh, it's very hard to get solutions when everybody has a different factual base. Uh, so uh, I think we have to find a way to use information technology to begin to uh, deal with facts and deal with truth and then quarrel about the solutions to it. There are a lot of different approaches. So that's a, Easier said than done, Neil, but I think the educational role, as you indicated, is missing in action now. And I think we're gonna to have to really figure out a way to restore that. News media, they play a big role here too. Um, right now, we, um, I remember Mark Shields, I believe it was, who said that people um, no longer uh, go to the news for their facts, they go for their ammunition and they tune into the uh, particular station that's going to give them the ammunition 
to uh, back up the uh, opinions they already hold dearly. So we're not open to, we're in an information age, but less receptive to uh, facts we don't like than probably we've been in a long, long time. Secretary Moniz, can I ask you about Iran? Yeah, could I first just add a, a point to, uh, to the last question? Of course. Uh, uh, namely that, uh, take an example, nuclear weapons are uniquely under the control of the president. The president has sole authority for nuclear weapons. You would think that might be uh, an interesting area to probe uh, in presidential election debates. Uh, <laughs> how the president approaches the sole authority uh, of the most destructive weapons in the world. Nothing. Uh, uh, secondly, I would say in that, in that regard, uh, we've kind of already said it, but I'll, I'll add to it. Uh, uh, nuclear weapons, pandemics, and climate change, uh, there's three areas of catastrophic risk uh, potential. Uh, I would say that pandemics and, uh, and climate change have gotten into the public debate, mainly because we've, we've been so badly impacted by it uh, already. Uh, the question is, how can we get nuclear weapons into the, into the discussion without having to go through uh, the experience? Uh, yeah. Because we really can't afford that one. Uh, you know, there's no, there's no mulligan uh, on that one. So, um, so that's really a challenge. And, and we're also working on, on new on uh, new uh, strategic communications approaches. Sorry, Iran. <laughs> yeah, Iran. So you obviously played a key role in putting together the Iran nuclear deal, this joint comprehensive plan of action. Uh, now, given President Trump's withdrawal from the deal, and then recently, of course, several, you know, a couple of assassinations, but the most recent one, uh, Motion uh, Fakhrizada, um, you know, how can the incoming administration strategically address the issue of encouraging Iran on this deal again? Uh, should we just renew the deal or are there a number of other issues that have to be put on the table? And, and what's the probability of making progress here? Uh, and, you know, for example, Iran's ballistic missile technology, should that be addressed at the same time? Or what about, uh, is precision guided uh, cruise missiles uh, scary in themselves with Iran uh, manufacturing them, perhaps using them, exporting them to other nations? Uh, you can't do everything all at once. So what would you say, uh, Ernie, about uh, the Biden administration moving forward on this particular uh, issue with Iran? Yeah, uh, first of all, um, I I'm not sure I would say exporting to other nations exporting to other subnational groups, I think is more, more, more precise. But uh, uh, I, think, I, think, um, I, I think, first of all, it really, uh, I think answering that question is helped by going back to what the JCPOA itself is and isn't. Uh, uh, the, the JCPOA uh, was a step-by-step -step approach in a sense that the first step was to remove, uh, as Sam said, the existential threat of nuclear weapons uh, in that in that region in the hands in the hands of Iran. Uh, it did not uh, it did not resolve the other regional issues or the missile issues, and I would just note that the JCPOA was an agreement of many countries with Iran, uh, the U.S., the U.K., France, Russia, and China, and Germany. Uh, and uh, uh, I also remind you and, and the listeners that uh, the JCPOA was signed in July of 2015. That was like a year and a half after uh, the Ukraine issues uh, began. So my point being, uh, we already were negotiating. <laughs> Russia was negotiating with us, and yet we had a very, very difficult relationship. The point of that is, in that time frame, negotiating the regional issues never had a chance of getting off the ground, even if one wanted uh, uh, to go there. So the view was, look, we, we put a deal in place with 15 years of uh, serious, significant constraints on activity and a permanent 
uh, verification regime, which actually is the heart of the deal. Now, we say the deal stood on its own for what it did in removing the Iranian nuclear threat. But we also said that we hoped over that 15 year period, some degree of additional trust would develop over some time uh, and that would maybe, and that would open up the possibilities of more negotiation. While we continue to press hard on the regional issues and maintained leverage, a point that is not recognized. The Iran deal removed only the nuclear sanctions, not the missile sanctions, not the terrorism sanctions, not the human rights sanctions. So there was still plenty of negotiating room left to go to address these other, these other regional issues. That all went away when the United States left the agreement. So now, in that context, going back, number one, at least my reading of it is, going back to the JCPOA, as has been stated by the Biden in the campaign, Biden, Biden campaign, again, it does not mean removing all the sanctions. It means removing nuclear sanctions. Still lots and lots to do there. What I think is different is what I personally hoped would be the three to five year period of building up uh, to seriously addressing those other regional and missile issues has kind of been shot. And so I think that in fact, in going back to the JCPOA, it has to be viewed and agreed to by all parties that it is, it is only a step starting an immediate negotiation on some other set of these major, uh, major, major issues. I think it's gonna to have to now uh, engage uh, much more, uh, not because we didn't try, but much more uh, the Arab states and Israel uh, in terms of getting a, after all, if it's a regional solution, it's their region. Uh, and so I think it's gonna be very, very difficult a um, uh, very hard job, but I think um, I think a President Biden uh, and uh, and his very experienced uh, um, uh, staff, I mean cabinet and 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 sub cabinet level uh, experienced here, committed to diplomacy. Uh, I think there's a good chance that they can, they can make some real real progress here, but it's going to be hard, and it's not just status quo ante. Thank you. Let me, could, could, I, could I just actually add you know, one more thing? You alluded to it uh, uh, in terms of conventional uh, cruise missiles and drones, uh, which were on display in the attack on um, the Saudi uh, uh, oil, oil facilities. Uh, and that's why I believe, uh, again, uh, first of all, I don't believe the withdrawal from the JCPOA has put us in a better place. Uh, it's put the Iranian economy in a worse place that's certainly true. But, uh, we have the United States Secretary of State talking about closing down our embassy in Iraq. Uh, we have the demonstration of precision uh, conventional weapons, uh, as, you've as, you as you've discussed. Uh, I, I, I have a hard time seeing the progress here. I see our reputation sullied um, in, for example, not providing uh, the uh, anything like the humanitarian support that the Iranian people should have had for COVID. Uh, I don't see any advantage in having uh, frayed our alliances uh, uh, with Europe. Um, we are we are in, we are we are in a worse place than, than we were uh, uh, five years ago. Let, so let me uh, pose a, a quite different kind of question. I'm kind of remembering a line from one of my favorite movies, The Russians Are Coming, but where, I don't know, some comedian says, we got to get organized, we got to get organized. So my question has to do with maybe, maybe two layers of the onion in terms of organization. First of all, the organization of the federal government. We have a number of different agencies, executive departments doing important things. Coordination is always an issue. But on these topics we're talking about today, 
what kind of shape are we in? For example, we're talking about security, both in the nuclear regime, conventional, bio, and so forth. And then another layer of the onion is the private sector, where a lot of our bio expertise is and in innovation and developments and so forth. So how well are we organized as a government? And then how well are we able to appropriately partner with the private sector in dealing with these issues? If that question makes any sense, please, either of you, uh, help me. Well, I'll just make a broad, broad observation is that the, the only good news about the warnings we're giving about the bio effort um, needing to address deliberate use of biological weapons uh, is that the same things you need to do in our country and indeed the world to protect against mother nature is also the same kind of thing you need to do to protect against bioterrorism. Uh, vaccines, public health strengthening, uh, getting back into WHO, uh, helping strengthen WHO, early warning systems so that we can get on top of any biological threat immediately, whether it is mother nature or whether it's deliberate, and we may not know that for months, uh, and working with the other major countries. Uh, so this is not, um, this cannot be America first here because the biological uh, problem or threat or uh, infectious disease that's in Africa one day can be in the Atlanta uh, airport the next day or in Austin or in Houston or in Washington, D.C. So this is a global problem and we are not organized for it. And one of the things that we are trying to um, help educate people on at NTI is the fact that we do have to work with other countries. And that includes in the vaccine. Um, the vaccines are, uh, a lot of vaccines are produced for uh, in massive uh, amounts in India. Um, and so we're going to have to have scientists working together across, across the globe to prevent what Ernie has alluded to, um, misuse and the dark side of uh, genetic engineering. Uh, we're going to have to have scientists across the globe working together. They're going to have to develop norms and best practices. And we're going to have to be very much more careful about how this uh, critical information is uh, disseminated. So, you know, we'd like to say we can close off our country, but germs don't stop at the border. And I think we have learned that uh, in the last year. Uh, Neil, in terms of the private sector, uh, we've already discussed on the bio side uh, that it's, you, can't, you can't address this without engaging the private sector uh, because the biotech world uh, is first and foremost a world in the commercial sector uh, with economic implications, health implications, uh, environmental implications, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But in the nuclear world, um, I'll just mention two things. Uh, one is, uh, first of all, in terms of nonproliferation, uh, it really is important that the United States uh, rebuild its nuclear power supply chain. Uh, the, uh, we are, we have become frankly secondary players. Uh, Russia, China are very happy to fill the void. Uh, and, um, uh, historically, uh, we have been able to, um, put in place, uh, the strongest nonproliferation norms through our bilateral, uh, nuclear, uh, agreements. Um, and the reason was because people wanted our technology uh, and, uh, and uh, would sign up to that. Uh, if, we, if we become a backwater uh, in nuclear uh, technology, uh, our leverage in nonproliferation is also uh, sacrificed. I'm happy to say that uh, I think the new developments uh, in nuclear energy innovation uh, are very encouraging. Uh, with small modular reactors and micro reactors, so-called Gen 4 reactors. Um, uh, but uh, that's where our government has also demonstrated a lack of organization uh, to be able to get that technology uh, uh, over the hump uh, or over the valley of death, whichever you prefer, the hump or the valley, uh, and, uh, uh, and get them into commercialization uh, where, where, again, uh, we can we can reassert, I think, some of our uh, nonproliferation leadership. 
uh, very, very encouraging, but, uh, but we, gotta, we gotta get it done in this decade. So the second point I'd make, to quite different, uh, but with Russia and, 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 and nuclear, and also the same would be true with China in the future, et cetera. But um, as you know very well, Neil, uh, in the, uh, let's say during the Cold War, uh, a very important activity of the United States and the Soviet Union was things like scientist to scientist exchanges, also cultural exchanges, people to people exchanges. Uh, and then when the and when the break came and the and the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, we had a lot of uh, uh, we had a, we had a lot of strength to draw upon. Uh, certainly, the scientist to scientist uh, uh, was was absolutely uh, critical. Now today we have a situation, obviously, with with a lot of economic sanctions, and so in terms of the private sector, there clearly are uh, some appropriate lines that have to be respected. My view, however, is. Uh, the, first of all, as Sam said earlier, uh, continuing diplomacy on the areas where we have joint responsibility to avoid catastrophe has to go on. And secondly, the people to people part uh, has to go on. Uh, that's the future. Uh, that provides us the opportunity to capture opportunity uh, to uh, to to reduce risks uh, in the future, so so I think that's that, that's a very important role also in the private sector world. Hey, thank you. We we have just a couple of minutes to go, and so I need to uh, we need to wind this up. I think let me ask one more question. Um, back on the bio side, uh, WHO has been uh, criticized. Uh, uh, from various directions, still seems to be a key organization when it comes to world public health and uh, presumably has a role in, uh, in addressing uh, possible uh, outbreaks of pandemics, either on purpose or accidental or so forth. But, but is it capable of doing that on its own? I mean, do we need another kind of an international regime, global regime that addresses uh, the threats of uh, biomaterials uh, uh, being used by, uh, uh, by, by countries or by individuals uh, against society. Uh, so what about WHO? What needs to change there? And do we need another uh, approach? Neil, I think we need to greatly strengthen WHO as the first, first resort. If we cannot, if we find we cannot strengthen WHO, then we're gonna have to find some way of uh, reinventing that capability because the credentials required to get into a lot of countries, you know, a lot of countries don't don't trust the major powers, but uh, there's a trust element from a lot of countries for WHO. So the legitimacy of WHO remains very important, but there's no doubt they've got a lot of problems and they've got to, they've got to be strengthened. Ernie? I, I mentioned earlier, Neil, that uh, we are working uh, uh, and I mentioned uh, the World Economic Forum, for example, uh, working uh, towards a global entity um, uh, to uh, help prevent pandemics. Uh, I, I should have I should have added, and I will add now that we are also in this. That effort also involves uh, the United Nations uh, Secretary General. Uh, it involves the WHO. In fact, this entity might be within the UN WHO orbit, or it could be separately. That's something that that is to be that is to be designed over the next a couple of years, because the WHO, in any event, is going to be a critical player, uh, 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 including the interaction with this entity. However, I'll say something a little bit more explicitly, perhaps, than I think Sam Sam hinted at. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's, this is not about WHO only, but let's face it, a lot of the major countries in particular love to form multilateral institutions as long as they aren't too independent. <laughs> uh, and as long as they don't have too much power, 
Uh, and and I I would just continue Sam's thought and say that uh, uh, I think we are going to have to recognize that these kinds of multilateral institutions do things that we cannot do, and they're going to do them well only when they have uh, sufficient independence, uh, uh, not threatened by budget, et cetera, et cetera, uh, to, to do these things for the common good. Thank you so much. Uh, so we do need to close. Uh, Senator, any last word? No, I think the uh, institutes like the Baker Institute have a real role to play here too. I think we've got to use information technology to have young people and universities in different countries talking to each other and learning what the technology are together and coming up with solutions together. Uh, that's the strength of the information age potentially. And I would love to see that. And I know Rice Baker Institute will be playing a huge role in this kind of public policy. Thank you so much. Ambassador, you're muted. Terrific discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Senator and uh, Secretary Moniz. Uh, this is exactly one of the roles of the Baker Institute is to get the expertise of uh, illustrious people like yourself to our various constituencies and uh, and thank you both for everything you've done and I know you're going to continue to do, do in this the critical issues that we've discussed today. Thank you very much. I would Michael, say the same to you, Ambassador. You've Mike. been a tremendous uh, asset for our country and you're continuing to be, you and Neil both. So thank you both for what you're continuing to do. Yes, and my, my closing word is help. <laughs> uh, my, my closing word is the struggle continues. <laughs> Thank you all. You have a have a good day, good week, good year. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.